Okay, we're recording. Lori, I'm moving you, don't worry. <laughs> Jesse, that's a very artsy view. <laughs> I was trying to figure out your graph first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be graphy or artsy. <laughs> okay, so it's like st we're still waiting on Steve, right? But we can. Yes, we're waiting on Steve as far as I know. Okay. Um, so, hello, everyone. Um, we have a couple of members of our group who are not going to be able to stay for the full meeting, but we're nice enough to join us to start so we could have everybody here to vote on um, chair and vice chair for next year. So um, if I keep talking a little bit, maybe Steve will join. <laughs> um, maybe we Yay. should, oh, here we go. Yay, oh. it worked. <laughs> Um, Steve, I was just stalling until you came on. So I think um, in the interest of letting those who were not planning to attend today leave, I'm gonna suggest we start with um, the vote and then we'll go back to the minutes and the public comment. Does that work for everybody? Okay, great. Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you then. Sure, okay. So the first thing is um, uh, are there folks who are interested in the chair position and you can identify yourself or um, if you want to nominate someone to be chair. So um, you can indicate by raising your hand and then I'll acknowledge you. Jesse, are you raising your hand or just messing with your phone? <laughs> <laughs> okay, from your from your face, I'm going to assume that's messing with your phone. Okay, is there anybody interested in sharing? Hmm. <laughs> is there somebody who wants to nominate somebody to chair? <laughs> and then we'll put them on the spot. <laughs> Well, I, I would like to encourage our new members to um, self-nominate if you are in a position to be able to chair because um, we've been doing it for three years and I think it's be really good for the committee for new newer members to do it. Dwayne has his hand up. Yep, and I, I really don't like doing this without um... A discussion ahead of time, but um, <clears throat> didn't know we'd run into the situation. So, um, um, and and don't if 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 you're not if you're not so inclined, that's fine. But I I I nominate um, Steve uh, to to chair. Um, I think he's has his um, really um, had, had not only his passion but his head really around. What ECAC does and can do, and and uh, and is in tune with the relationship with the town council, um, and uh, and I, I take Andre's point for sure uh, with regard to a, a newer member, and maybe a newer member could co-chair um, or chair. Uh, but I and Steve, feel free to turn yourself down for sure <laughs> because uh, I don't want to burden people with uh, work that I I'd rather not do. <laughs> so. Eve? Thank you, Dwayne, but I, I, I'm going to decline and um, I'm going to, to continue with the work that I'm doing. And I really would like to focus on those specific efforts that I've been working on rather than trying to herd the committee and other projects around. Okay, any other nominations or self? I'll, I'll, I'll step on toes. Dwayne style. Um, I, I actually, I think any one of the people here would do a fantastic job. And that's something I really appreciate about this group. I'm thinking about 
uh, Vasu's ability to consolidate information and present it graphically and just organizational skills and being a new member of the committee and like Dwayne needing to not take on more perhaps. I just, I feel like he would be a great um, kind of manager of, of all of these ideas. And so I would nominate Vasu. Vasu, do you accept the nomination? Oh, well, thanks, Jesse. Um, well, I mean, I, it's something I have to think about, but, um, you know, on one hand, I think the education and outreach committee is is a lot already, and I've been connecting. We'll talk about the staff member updates, but we've been trying to connect with different groups, and so I, I think that's an important portion of what we should be doing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've done program management at work. I can manage the strategy. I, I get that, Jesse. Um, I, I don't know if I'm if I have the connections like, uh, you know, all of you do and, and the understanding of the different, uh, you know, opportunities that, uh, that we all have. So I, maybe that's where, you know, I woke up to all of you. So something to think about, I, I think. Um, I didn't really give this a thought. And uh, yeah, I think like uh, Dwayne said, uh, maybe we should have thought about this right before the meeting and whether this is gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, we had, I had sent out a message, you know, encouraging people to consider who they might nominate. So, or self nominate. So Laura. Yeah, I just want to, um, I don't know if it's a word of encouragement or not, but, um, you know, when this group started in, in 2019, um, I was nominated by someone I didn't know to be chair and, um, I, I took it on with a lot of um, not nervousness, I guess is the right word, because I didn't know, um, you know, I've run, run meetings and chaired things and build consensus at my job, but I'd never done it in town. And I certainly still struggle Vasu, with understanding how decisions are made and who's doing what and what's going on. So I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, it'll be continued work in progress for everybody on this committee. Um, so I would, I just maybe encourage you or Stella or Lori or whoever wants to potentially run for chair or vice chair um, to, you know, and I, and I, and this group has always been very wonderful and supportive, um, particularly with childcare issues and other things looking at you, Stella. So just throwing that out there too. <laughs> <laughs> you mean a child care issue as in we have no child care <laughs> <laughs> the child care issue no child care <laughs> no no um, fall we will <laughs> does anybody else uh, and one thing i will want to i do want to say too is that no one is going to be expert in every single area of what you're working in so you know the expertise that you all bring you know, you all have your strengths, not everyone knows everything. So, and you're not expected to, that's why you're a committee of people with varied backgrounds. Um, and I'm certainly, I will work very closely with whoever is chair and we always go over the agenda ahead of time. And, you know, if there are things that come up, we'll, we'll meet about them separately from the group. And, um, you know, I'm here to support you in, in the leadership role as well. So, um, just putting that out there too. So is there anybody else who is considering someone? Andra, you have your hand up. Um, yes. Um, uh, I think it would just be great to talk openly, you know, about people's life circumstances and experience and, and, um, but I understand we have to do it in a formal way. So um, I'm going to uh, nominate Laurie so we can hear from Laurie about it. Um, um, well, I, I'm, I'm flattered, but I think like, I, I do feel pretty new on this um, and at this and at dealing with the town as well. I've chaired plenty of things at UMass and in other aspects of my life, but not for town. Um, 
So I, I feel like I'm still learning the ropes. <laughs> I, I'm on the agenda for the first time today and I'm, and I'm still trying to figure that out, right? So, <laughs> um, but with that, I'd sort of like to ask Laura, what does the position, we just heard from Stephanie a little bit about how she sees the position. What do you see yourself doing? As, what were you doing as chair? Yeah, great question. Um, so some of it was, you know, purely procedural, you know, doing the agenda and um, working with Stephanie to figure out what needed to be in the packet and making sure the agenda was right and getting that posted on time. Um, you know, early on, we had a pretty clear, um, I think we're at, a, we're at an interesting inflection point of this committee. Um, I think I've said this before, you know, early on we were really focused on setting goals. So we spent a lot of time first, you know, six to 10 months really working on setting goals. The, the next year and a half, we were really focused on setting our climate plan. Um, and now we're focused, you know, we're moving into implementation. And so, you know, I think there's an opportunity for this chair to figure out the best way, you know, work with, with the committee to figure out the best way to move forward on implementation. And we think we have some really great ideas and momentum coming out of our retreat on that. Um, you know, there's there's opportunities to to be a voice in the community, you know, you know, present to the town council and those things. But if that's not something the chair wants to do, they can also delegate someone else on the committee to do that. So, um, you know, I think it's about consensus. I mean, I think a lot of my work, I would say, is, is building consensus, trying to hear different people's point of view, trying to make sure we were capturing all of that and seeing if I couldn't, but from listening to everybody, figure out a path, a path forward. Um, so I think anybody who's had experience doing that in project management or in other committees would be well suited to do that to do that with this group and even potentially easier because we're all here for the same reason. <laughs> um, you know, we're here for a common goal and we volunteer to be here. So we're all here to, um, you know, we're all here to work towards the common goal. I will say the one challenge is, you know, we're all very busy and have things going on. So, you know, getting, getting folks to, to find time to do the work, I think is the, the biggest challenge. Yeah, Stephanie. I want to add something too, um, as far as the implementation piece, because I think there's some confusion. And the implementation is really not the responsibility of your committee. You can advise on the implementation, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily the responsibility of you to make sure um, you come up with exactly what should happen, because that's really, this committee is advisory to the town manager and the report, the climate action plan and and resiliency plan that you put together is to guide the town manager. So, you know, sometimes I think you maybe put some additional pressure on yourselves that you don't necessarily need to, but you can certainly be engaged in the work I would say that Steve is doing with the CRC right now is a great example of the ways where you all can offer your expertise. Um, and that's one, you know, one project that you're working on. Oh. Sue, you're working on the outreach and education. That's another piece but you don't necessarily all have to do absolutely everything all the time at every meeting. You know, you really can hone in and focus on certain things on certain meetings, because I think maybe part of the problem is people getting very overwhelmed by all of it. So maybe trying to bite this off in um, digestible chunks might be easier. So with that in mind, I think um, what I'd like to say is that I'm, again, I'm, I'm flattered. I think that I would be a better vice chair <laughs> Um, because I feel like I still want to bite into some little piece of this and get my teeth around that before um, trying to wrangle everything. Um, so I, I think I'd be happy to take a vice chair nomination. Um, I'm also on sabbatical this year, and my goal for sabbatical is actually to learn more about the energy transition and to get more involved in this sort of work. So um, I'd like the time to read and figure stuff out without having to do organizational things. I'm sort of trying to shed some of the organizational stuff I usually do at UMass, for example. Um, but I think coming back next year, um, you know, I'd be happier then to be nominated again. And I'd like to nominate Stella. <laughs> well, I think it's a very nice job of getting up and running on this committee faster than I have, for sure. Uh, that's very kind. I just can't do anything more than what I'm doing right now. <laughs> um, but 
on that note, I, I'll nominate Jesse. Jesse hasn't been nominated <laughs> yet. Jesse, what's your reason for not not being able to do, do it? Ah, uh, well, um, I don't think I would do a good job because of the time. I think I'm already starting to miss four meetings, including the rest of this one. Um, I have sort of less thrilling and exciting. I, both of my parents are in fairly dire physical health right now, and I'm suddenly um, driving to Boston once a week. And it's and not to play like a sob story. They're amazing and wonderful, and it's all great. But two kids, full-time job. Um, I I want to... It's all, I already feel like I'm not doing a good enough job for this committee. And I just agreed to, to step in and start helping Steve on the rent, some of the rental stuff. And so I just think it, I think it's just too much. And, it, and it's interesting. And I really appreciate what Stephanie just said about, I think we maybe are do, trying to do too much all at once anyway. And I think in general, um, I think of this chair and co-chair position as like should be heavily supported by all of us. Ideally, it's not a, a, a giant lift compared to the rest. I think Laura has set a tone of doing a tremendous amount of work, um, which is great. But I also think I also like keep coming back to this idea of sustainability is also having to be that our lives are sustainable if we burn out and stop working in a year, then, then it's not sustainable um, and we stop doing it. So keeping it fun, keeping it lo lovely, joyful. I would, I would offer my support to anyone who can, can do that. So right now we have Vasu as a maybe with Lori, a definite interest in the vice chair position. So we Vasu, oh, sorry, go we ahead, Andrew. We, we haven't heard from Don yet. I'd like to hear Don's story. So I nominate Don. Oh, oh. <laughs> thank you so much, Andrea. Um, I don't, I don't know that I have any of those sorts of skills. I've, I've never really, you know, the kind of organizational skills and leadership skills that you're talking about. I've, you know, I've, as a lawyer in a big Boston law firm, and then at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and then on my own, um, I've never really had to kind of run meetings or or do anything that would require me to run meetings um so i'm not sure i have the skill set to do it that's you know that's i mean i am 70 and i am slowing down at my practice so i have more time if i would stop having vacations but um i'm not sure that i have the skill set andrea sorry andrea has anybody nominated Andrew? We should hear. <laughs> are you gonna? Are you nominating Andrew, Lori? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Your turn, Andrew. Hang on. Oh, I'm sorry. For those who came in late, my grandbaby was just born a few hours ago, and um, I'm being called into action shortly. And um, no, I really can't do it. Okay. I, I, I have a full plate and now a grandbaby who I want to clear things off my plate to spend time with. So throwing it back to Vasu and Laurie to- Yes, yes. So back to the two of you. Hair. Are you interested as Vasu, does it make, you know, does it help you knowing that Laurie is willing to be vice chair? Well, I was originally thinking about vice chair as well, and then Lori, you, you talked about that. So uh, and I guess, Laura, I have a question for you. How, how many hours do you spend outside of this That's the question. meeting? So, so it depends um, on what we're doing. I think the work was most intense when we were working on the report. Um, there's also the possibility that, you know, I don't know, Stephanie, maybe this is not a possibility, but you could treat, you could, I think we still need a chair and vice chair, but you could treat them more like a co-chair position and, and do more work together. 
Um, I was never able to manage that just because I would sometimes have to do the ECAC work at 10 o'clock at night because that was when I had time to do it. And so that wasn't, that wasn't useful for me, but I think that works for other committees as well. So that could be, be an option, have one as chair and name and one as, as vice chair, but you sort of work more closely together. Yeah, I guess if you were to give an estimate of how much time you spent per week, um, because so, I am in different committees too, so I just want to. So just to do, just purely to do the chair work, not much, like an hour extra, an hour or two extra to coordinate with Stephanie on agendas and stuff. I think the, the, the challenge with chair, and I think this gets back to focusing, um, which I've been uh, trying to get this this group to do for over a year now, I would say, um, is if we want if, if we want to do something and no one else is stepping up, then it kind of falls on the chair's responsibility or it gets not done, right? So I think that's, and, and maybe that's a, a, a situation where I wasn't managing the group as well as, as we could have. But I would say the times where I had to do more work is when, you know, we needed to prepare a statement for, somebody or you know do something like that 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 needed to be done by the chair okay so i mean i like the i you know i i think it could be fine for you to to um work as sort of work as co-chairs if you're willing to do that. I'm mostly worried about being protective of my time through December, through January, actually. And then come February, I will have a little more time. But um, I, like I say, I wanna try to focus on other than organizational things <laughs> uh, for a few months. I don't mind helping out if uh, Vasu, if you'd be willing to do it, I, you know, I could be relied on to, if you, if you ask me, I'll probably do it anyway, because I'm a fool about things like that. <laughs> end up spending far too much time. Um, but, you know, if you would take the brunt of it for the first year, say, and we can swap places if, if folks want to do that next year. Everyone, well, so your position, I, I should note that this term is for a year. It's for a year. So we it's can one swap. year. So, you know, next year at this time, we'll Talk once about again it. have a nomination for a chair and vice chair. It's annual. So you're not committing bef beyond this one year. Did we have a vice chair before? Yes, Andra. Oh, Andra. Hi, Andra. Can I, can I propose, uh, if no one else is interested, can I propose that we postpone this to the next time we meet? Um, I, I crumble under peer pressure. If people want me to do it, I'll, I'll do it. So I just, I just want to take some time and, and think about it too. And uh, maybe even talk to Laurie, Laurie offline. Okay, sure. So um, we can put it on the next meeting's agenda, although we don't, um, we'll have to have a discussion about when our next meeting is. Um, and I think we're going to put that a little further down um, because we won't have Laura or myself on the 29th. And then the meeting after that is July 13th. So um, we can put it on the July 13th agenda. Laura won't be here, but I think as far as I know, she's the only one that won't be available for that meeting, although that changes because we have three people today that are now about to leave. And we only planned for one. <laughs> so um, is everyone okay then with putting this off? I mean, someone is going to have to be chair. We, we do have to have a chair, so. You know, for all of you, if Basu, after thought, you decide you can't do it, then I think everybody needs to sort of think hard and fast about whether they really feel like they can make the commitment to, to do it. So it, I, I can understand Basu wanting to, um, you know, have some time to think it through and, you know, get things in order in your head. Um, and if Laura is not here for the next two meetings, is that right? Correct. Um, I will be chair if we haven't chosen new chairs and vice chair. So there, you get almost 
you get a month. Yeah, because I don't think we can do it, Stephanie, when you're not here, right? Well, you could have a meeting on the 29th, but I think without you and me not here on the 29th, I think you should just make that the one meeting this summer that you skip because it'll also be our third meeting in June. So you could go right to the July 13th meeting as the next meeting. And Laura, and Laura won't be here, but Andrea, you could share that meeting on the 13th. Is it possible for us to move it up a week since we'll be skipping? Um, and would that allow Laura to be here? No. That would be July 6th. Laura will not, be, yeah, Laura won't be here. Okay. So um, I'd have to check. I don't, I have to look. I mean, it sort of throws off our schedule a bit, so. And as I said, we have, we've already had two meetings. This is our second June meeting. And then we are going to have two meetings in July. I'm um, in July as well. So. Um, is that okay with everybody then? Yeah. Oh, Jesse. I, I, it's not only do I think it's okay. I think it's good to sit and think on it. And I'll just throw out the other statement of who, if anyone does become, if someone will become chair and I would encourage us to think knowing that everyone's kind of feeling the pressures to really work hard to make that a role that can delegate that it doesn't become a burden um and that we can share that load and it becomes you know we have just proven that we are a cooperative group um and can work together so i just want to sort of plant that seed of the role of the chair um as being highly supported and and being able to delegate work to make it a lighter load Yes. Um, also, speaking of which, we, I think, Lori, you were up to take minutes at this meeting. I realized that and have actually been taking, but I didn't get all the nominations of who was nominating. Who. I've got them all. I don't worry about it. You can leave gaps and I'll fill them in. Okay, thanks. So, okay, so with that, it sounds like we're going to move this to the July 13th agenda. So I w don't want to keep those of you who were kind enough to to make the time to come to this meeting when you had other things. So Andra, congratulations. Yeah. Um, Jesse, all the best. And Dwayne, I hope you're having a relaxing time. <laughs> <laughs> so Great. thanks you three. Uh, thank you all. And um, just again, I think I mentioned this last time, but I'm happy to talk to anybody offline specifically about the work of the chair and what you could or couldn't do in the role um you know so don't hesitate to reach out if you have any interest um okay so let's go to reviewing minutes i move we accept them as they are i have some comments uh, let me pull it up I think there are parts of the minutes where I, I know, uh, for example, I think member 4A talks about you know, fireflies. I don't, I don't think that's really, I, I know we just talked about it and I, I think there was another section where, uh, I don't think we need to record all the information that was talked about during, um, during the meeting. I think the point of the fireflies and Steve, you can certainly correct me, um, mm -hmm. but I think because Steve said they were early, some of that might be actually climate related. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, that's why that would be relevant to a discussion of this meeting. Yes, that was part of the point of mentioning that <laughs> the season is uh, at least two weeks early, at least based on the way the plants and animals are responding. Not a purely scientific observation but <laughs> and it's it's consistent with what we've been seeing in new england you know things are definitely not as they typically are on schedule so um so vasu i i mean i don't know i think there was relevance to that being there but do you i think that's fine um i, I thought there was another comment that i had but i can't find it so um I'm good with it. Okay. Okay. So Lori's motion stands to accept the minutes. Does somebody want a second? I'll second. Okay. 
I had a question about minute taking because it was my first minutes, which is what's the is what's the convention on first versus last names? Because the minutes that I was working off as a template went back and forth kind of chaotically. <laughs> I, so I just wanted to say, and when I typically, if I really take the time, I change all the first names to last names. Okay. So I would I say all last of names you, is like more formal, but first names is more readable. Yeah, but I would um because sometimes you have people with the same first name i know we don't right now but just as a standard format you should just use last names okay okay so i'm going to go for a voice vote um lori moved Vasu second so allison abstain and d yeah sounds good Vasu. Yes. Laura? Yes. Lori? Yes. Roof? Yes. Okay, the minutes are approved. Okay, I'm just gonna make a note that Andra, Dwayne and Jesse left the meeting. Okay. Um, opening it up to public comment. So if you are in the public and want to speak, please raise your hand electronically. Okay. No one has indicated they'd like to speak. Okay, um, so let's move on to updates. And I heard from Anna that she had an update, but she's gonna have to leave the meeting early. So maybe we could start with her if that's okay with you, Stephanie, and then switch sure. to you. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Okay, Anna, I've allowed you to talk. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, Sorry, yeah, Laura, I just had to switch to my phone, but we are all good. So a couple things. Um, first, I do want to just take one moment and have a huge thank you to Laura for chairing um, ECAC so gracefully for the, the past couple years, um, especially through the CARP report, which was no small feat. Um, and, you know, I can't really emphasize enough how much that's a driving document for the council really in the next many years. Um, I think he gave us a deadline in 2030. So, you know, marking down those years, but we've got a deadline. Um, and so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and then a couple other things just that are coming down the docket. Um, the biggest update is that the budget was passed at our last council meeting. Um, and so there are a couple uh, sustainability. Um, well, there are a lot of sustainability elements in there. And, and I'm sure Stephanie will give you a good overview on those. Um, upcoming things that I want to make sure are on your radar, um, a couple counselors are bringing forward a zero waste bylaw. Um, I have not seen it yet, but I've heard that it's coming forward. So once that does get brought forward, I will pass it along to you all. And I think what might make the most sense is to, if you can just maybe discuss it at a meeting or however you decide to handle it, but um, would love your feedback on, on that draft of a bylaw as we go into discussions. So once I know when that'll be introduced and what the timeline is, um, I will send that your way. And then um, the other thing is I'm exploring a bylaw around rental utility disclosures. This was something that Evan Ross, former counselor, had written um, but did not get around to introducing before um, his term ended. And so right now I'm going through it just to see does this still make sense or given um, the work of CRC on the rental registration bylaw. So just kind of cross-checking. Um, and if it does still make sense to do a rental utility disclosure bylaw, I obviously will, will need some partnership on that from ECAC. Um, and so I would love whoever the next chair is for you to keep that in mind. Um, again, as I go through it, if I decide that it's still uh, still is, is different enough and does something that we need. Um, and I might reach out to individuals to, to get your perspective on that as well. And then lastly, um, the other thing that is on my radar is the 
uh, reporting for our capital inventory. Um, and I know Stephanie does some elements of this. Um, the, the things that I'm talking about are specifically for the Joint Capital Planning Committee. We get a report on all of the capital assets, so vehicles, buildings, et cetera. I know I've talked about this before, but now that the budget has been passed for fiscal year 23, um, now is the time where I can write a memo to finance committee saying, these are the things that we want to know about our capital inventory. So what do we need to know about vehicles? What do we need to know about buildings? And then how do we use that information? So again, that's something that I, um, would, I don't think would be smart for me to do alone. Uh, I think that's this is a kind of a prime spot to get ECAC input. Um, and so I want to I want to really make sure that we can tag team that. So I guess I'm kind of maybe pitching some future agenda items if, if y'all are able to um, to add those looking down the road and, and that's something you're interested in. That would be great. I think that's all I've got. Is there any are there any questions for me? And I, I'm on my phone, so just just talk at me if you've got questions. Anna, Otherwise, uh, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anna, this is Steve. I, I would be interested I in see. taking a look at the um, the draft utility disclosure that you were looking at and compare some notes. I, I've I've read about sure. some strategies for doing that, um, and we could talk offline or another time about how that might work with the. Uh, rental registration bylaw changes that CRC is working on. There's also Steve, another... that'd be great. If... Oh, sorry, Stephanie. No, no, go ahead, Anna. Uh, go I was ahead. just going to say, that'd be great. Feel free to, to shoot me an email. Um, and again, like what I have is, is Evan's draft. I haven't really dug into it yet, but I'm happy. I would love your input. So yes, please. Great. Um, and I think we should um, probably coordinate the three of us because there's also another effort that's underway by a whole other group that isn't even part of the RMI effort. Um, that's uh, several municipalities. Um, so I can, and I've I've been peripherally involved because there's just so much going on, but um, yeah. I do intend to get more information so I can share that with both you and Steve. Is it about about rentals yes. and utility? Oh, okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah, please um, please let me know. And, and also maybe Mandy too, if she's not already tied in. Um, yep. Yeah. Thank you. This is exciting. I feel like, you know, with five different approaches, we're at least going to get one thing, right? <laughs> that's, that's how it'll work. Great. Thanks. All right. I think, yeah. And let's, thank you so much. Um, okay. And I'll turn it over to Stephanie. Okay. Um, so uh, quickly, um, solar landfill vegetation clearing just happened for the fence installation. The fence installation is going to happen the week of the 27th. Uh, that's on the south landfill. So that will pretty much wrap up that project. Um, and we'll be doing some kind of a ribbon cutting event at some point, I think, in July or August. Um, the solar bylaw working group members have been confirmed by the town council. Uh, the committee is made up of, or the working group is made up of four committee reps. Um, Dwayne from ECAC, Laura Pagliarulo from the CONCOM, uh, Jack Jemsek from the Water Protection Supply Committee, and Janet McGowan from the Planning Board. And then we have three resident members who are Martha Hanner, um, Dan Corcoran, and Bob Brooks, who was formerly on the Conservation Commission. Um, that group will be meeting for the first time next week on the 22nd at 9.30 in the morning. Um, we did secure funding for a consultant to work with the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Uh, that was the planning department um, had submitted for that capital request. Um, and there's been $25,000, I believe, that have been approved for hiring a consultant to assist with the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, remember that's separate from the assessment. Um, the Fort River Farm Community Garden um, plot signups have been going gangbusters. We have like 20 gardeners out there now, which is really wonderful. This is a food justice, food security effort initiative that we're working, partnering with Healthy Hampshire on. So that's been really fabulous to see that kind of turnout. And it's very diverse. It's really, it's really such a wonderful project. I can't say enough. Um, ribbon cutting events for both the Fort River Farm Conservation Area 
in the solar landfill are likely, as I said, to happen sometime in July or August. Um, and unfortunately, Anna teed me up for information I don't have at my fingertips for you about the budget, but I'll try to get that information for next time. Steve. Yeah, Steve. Stephanie, the, the solar bylaw working group, that's a, uh, you said June 22nd, 9 a.m.? Correct. And that's 9.30 a.m. Yep. 9 30. That's a public meeting. Yes, they are. It's public Great. meeting. It will be posted. We're working on developing the um, the web page. It's just in the queue of many other things that our communication director is overburdened with right now at the moment. Um, could, could you try to send us a link to that meeting when when it becomes available? Um, sure. Just know that it will be posted in the calendar, the town website calendar as well. So that's always the official posting place to find meeting information. Just some, and that's, I'm saying that for the benefit of the public as well, because sometimes folks don't know that. Um, sorry, so that's the solar bylaw working group. Okay. And um, Stephanie, remind mm -hmm. me again, is it, you that that's leading that group from the staff side or is it you and chris jointly leading that group um chris breaststrup and i together uh but primarily i'll be sort of i think mostly serving as the lead for the group i'll be the i think i'll be the primary staff liaison okay so chris and i put together an agenda today um and i'll be facilitating the meeting you know until we elect a chair which hopefully will <laughs> yield results I just said, it's funny because I said today, it's like nobody wants to lead anything anymore. <laughs> so do, is there um, a time frame? Like, does this group have a end date or? Yes, they do. Yeah, it's May 31st. They have to be completed. It's a one year, basically a one year um, effort. It, it can be extended if certainly if they get to a point where for some reason they can't move forward, then they can request an extension of the town council for the committee. But right now, it's targeted as May 31st of 2023. And I don't really see a reason why they wouldn't be done at that time. Okay. Um, any questions for Stephanie? Okay, great. This is not a question for you, Stephanie, and this is not, um, directed at you in any way. I just want to publicly state that I'm disappointed that this working group, when they was meant to have five committee members and two community members, of which just a reminder that committee members are all community members. Um, and because there wasn't a representative from the Board of Health, they added another community member and didn't first come to the committees to see if they would like an extra person. I do feel like this committee is really lacking the focus on the climate goals that it needs. So I just want to publicly state that. Okay, ECAC member updates. Or Steve, did you want to add something? Yeah, I want to, I guess I can add to that. I sort of feel the same way. I don't know these community members at all. Um, I think the other members I've seen at work on their committees and I think they're all excellent. I think we all can, if we wish, remain involved as both ECAC members and community members. So I would encourage people to tune into the meetings and make comments. They could be certainly be personal comments. And then we can also help Dwayne um, prepare you know, whatever he, he needs and we can help support him to sort of represent the climate needs as best as possible. Just for a quick background, Martha Hanner is a planetary scientist and Bob Brooks uh, is a forester, has a forestry background, was a professor at UMass and Dan Corcoran currently, I believe works at UMass uh, as a researcher and also has a forestry background. Yeah, thanks. Just, Stephanie, uh, that's that just so you know. That doesn't change my point that they're not focused on the. I mean, maybe they're focused on our climate goals, but that none of those none of those backgrounds mean that they're focused on the climate goals of the uh, town. That's not why I, I just shared that information just so you know. Okay, thanks, Stella. You have your hand up. 
Oh yeah, I just wanted to say it's kind of a question comment for you on your update. I uh, I'm really interested and in also have professional and amateur background in the community gardening um, stuff. So I, I don't think that's the focus of this committee right now, but I just wanted to flag that and have that on your radar that, um, yeah. <laughs> if you want to reach out to me separately. Yeah, any any support you that. need in that, uh, I'd be interested in helping with. Okay, sure. Okay, great, ECAC member updates. Yes, Steve. I can give an update of the progress that we have made on the um, rental housing energy efficiency. Um, this is something that for those of you who are somewhat new, I've been working on with Andra for at least a year, along with some help from RMI and two other community members, Chris Riddle and Felicia um, Maledna. Um, so just oh, checking the date here, last, very beginning of June, the uh, CRC, the Amherst CRC, that's the Community Resource Council, which is an arm of the town council. And they are often charged with sort of developing the details of um, initiatives on the council. So they are working, the CRC is working on revising the rental registration bylaw that's in town. It's been in town for what, 10 years or more. And that requires anyone renting, um, doing sort of normal apartment renting to, to register. They're planning and, and going through a fairly major revision on that. So at their meeting in the beginning of June, Stephanie and I attended and provided some background. And I'm pleased to report that they were very open to our ideas for improving energy efficiency of rentals. Um, what the CRC is doing now is they are drafting a draft uh, new rental registration bylaw, and then it will be going out to, um, I think, probably more town staff. Some town staff is involved at the moment. It'll be going out for public review. It'll be going back to the council. Um, and at some point, it, so it'll get revised a lot along the way. And then at some point, the council will vote on adopting it or not. So right now it's compiling and putting together and discussing lots of details about the rental registration. So they, they were very happy to hear and excited about our ideas for improving rental energy efficiency. I had shared with them two reports that sort of outline strategies for doing this. One is a report by RMI called Better Rental, Better City, and another report by the American Council on Energy Efficient Economies uh, called A New Lease on Energy Guide for energy efficient rentals. Um, so they liked the idea. And um, one of the first things that we were asking for was more questions on the rental permit application that, that property owners have to fill out each year. And there's now language in that draft new bylaw that will allow the town to ask questions about sustainability, energy efficiency, and utility information on the dwelling units to be rented that the principal code official deems reasonable and appropriate. And this allows the principal code official to sort of choose those questions and perhaps change them over time without the bylaw itself having to be changed. And it goes on to say questions such as heating fuel source and type, age of the heating system, presence of photovoltaics or electric vehicle charging stations on the property and a few other things. So that, that's great. That, that gets in there, um, will allow us, if that gets adopted, to have much better insight onto the, the, both the appliances, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, domestic hot water appliances and, at homes, as well as features like photovoltaic panels and, and vehicle charging. We also talked about our ideas that, that our group has been talking about exploring for some sort of energy assessment um, to be completed, to be required as part of getting a rental permit. These are building energy assessments, or at least the ones that I've been looking at mostly. And they're usually you go through a checklist that looks at the types of walls, how much insulation is in the attic, looking at the age and efficiency of the heating appliances and so forth. And then these go into, um, you enter them usually, well, 
they go into some software that reduces all that information into a score. It might be a one to 10 score for some of them, or it might be, I think one popular one has a zero to 150 score, kind of like SAT scores um, with 100, I think, being the average. Anyways, they're interested in that. They ask some questions about it and um, sort of we're excited to hear more. And I've sort of promised that our group will bring them more information on these different options for assessing buildings. And so I'm working with Andra and Chris and Felicia, and I've roped in Jesse a little bit to try to explore. There's several different ones that are available, including one by the Department of Energy that's free to use. And it looks like there's a one page form that might be pretty easy to use. Um, so that, that's, that's what we're working on. And we'll hopefully give the town some ideas for how to implement this um, building energy assessment. The idea being, you know, I'm looking for notes that I wrote on an envelope, I don't see it. Um, <laughs> the first phase would be to try to identify the buildings that are the least efficient and would have sort of the biggest bang for the buck for some focused efforts to improve energy efficiency. And from what I've learned, it, you know, that would be the buildings that have no insulation in them or really, really old heating systems. So for the first year or two or three, it might be trying to find those, identify those buildings and help the owners with um, information and finance, connecting them to financial assistance so they can make improvements. And then we might have more information. It's like we might be able to get past those really bad buildings and start sort of working up the chain of buildings to some of the buildings that are only slightly bad. Um, and hopefully then we would have a better sense knowing more about the buildings, what we might target, whether that would be looking at the heating appliances or air sealing or insulation or all three that we don't know yet until we have a better idea of the, the building stock. So that's, that's the developments. We have a fairly short period of time because CRC, I believe, wants to sort of finish the drafting of the bylaw. Oh, what is that, Stephanie? Do you remember, is it like in the next month or two, you want to finish the sort of a draft bylaw and then start to put it out the public comment and review? Yeah, I think it was within a month or so. Yeah. That was my understanding that I remember anyway. So, so we have just a fairly short amount of time to sort of pull together these ideas, get it in the draft, and then sort of refine it, uh, defend it if necessary during the, the public review process. And just a quick question. Yeah. Everything you just mentioned is part of this one bylaw, right? Because it's a lot of different pieces, it sounds like. There's... Yes. Yeah, okay. Just wanted yeah, to make so sure. The, the, yeah. Sort of the two big buckets here is to, um, in and allow the bylaw to ask information, additional information about the buildings, mm -hmm. and to have the bylaw sort of per, perhaps authorize or require these building inspections right. as part of the rental process. Information gathering and um, assessment. Assessment, and yeah, and then maybe requirements from there. Presumably, there's a follow up. I don't know if it'd be part of this bylaw or another one to follow up with these required changes, right? That's right. Yeah, that would be sort of the phase three, which okay. would be to add some sort of a threshold that if buildings are below a certain score, then they will need to be updated uh, in some way. Um, my gut sense is that we may not be able to develop that fully right now, and that might have to come after a couple of years of collecting data. Hey, see what percent of the uh, buildings are rental units? What percent of the buildings in town? Huh? I don't know. Um, Fifty-six percent or so of town residents are renters. And one of the things I hope to do with our little group is to analyze the rental data, the rental housing data that we have. It's not as complete as we would like, but I think we can still go in there and answer some questions. Um, we, we only have how data for rental housing, so I don't know if we can answer what percentage of housing is, is rental housing. Um, 
but we would like to know more, say what percentage of it is standalone housing built before 1950 that might be good candidates for air sealing and insulation. Yeah, I wonder if it'll come out of Anna's uh, uh, JPCC, I believe the building inventory, uh, maybe we can, I don't know. Yes, perhaps. Anna. I can offer some, if it's okay. Uh, so JCPC is just town owned buildings and vehicles. So that wouldn't be covered in this. Um, Steve, as I'm listening, I think the part that you're talking about, I, I, I wanna, I, let's talk more because I think that um, the part you're talking about, I think might be a tough ask for this, for the rental registration bylaw. But I wonder if there's a way to, um, instead of, well, maybe for, maybe adding a phase between two and three and incentivizing um, by reducing registration fees versus requiring changes. I think those are two really big options that are that could be on the table. Um, and, and incentivizing could be something that we look at with rental disclosure, um, with a rental disclosure bylaw. Like that could be utilized to kind of take that next step if a lot of the initial thoughts that were going to go in it are covered in the new registration bylaw. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, that makes sense. I think we have to sort of figure out what we can get into this current rewrite of the registration bylaw, what makes sense to be in the registration bylaw, and what might make sense to be in other sorts of future bylaws. Yeah, yep. Oh, and Stephanie, do you want to announce at least formally the, um, that the grant has been awarded? It was at least it was now the Empower, the CEC grant that was announced on the town webpage earlier this week. Oh, that we've talked about a million times and <laughs> said we embargoed the information even though we kept sharing it. Yes, sure. <laughs> so now so it's, it's official. <laughs> yes. And I did get the final, I got a final draft of the contract, which still has not yet to be, it's got to be signed. So we still haven't engaged in the contract, but um, yes. So the Mass CEC Empower Grant for $25,000 has been awarded. Um, the town is partnering with Family Outreach of Amherst. They are primarily going to be the ones who will be um, administering a survey to renters in the community to find out about, um, just to get basic information about the sort of comfort levels and, um, you know, what it's like being a renter, like what, you know, some very basic, not many questions just to sort of get eek from them, like what are the issues that they have, you know, are there problems with windows, are there problems with drafts, um, do they do they or don't they have control over their thermostats, so those types of questions that can lead to get some um, information about, you know, how to address the efficiency of rental, rental housing stock, so that's happening um, will happen over the summer and the end result will be basically a white paper at, at the very end of all the gathering of that data. Um, but it should just, you know, I think a lot of this is gonna be led by family outreach because they've engaged and hired community members to, um, to do the outreach and, and they're all, I think they're all renters. Great. Anna, do you still have your hand up? I put it back up, yeah. I just wanted to quickly respond to Vasu. Um, in 2020, I believe 37.5% of our homes were rentals. So 62.5% are owner-occupied. Yep, but that was 2020, so it may, uh, you know, who knows, two years, good shift. Thanks. Yeah, Lori. One thing I just want to add that I, I think ought to be mentioned um, in this context is I don't know how many of you have noticed this, but as a homeowner in Amherst, I have been a little bit alarmed by the number of investors that are buying up properties, um, investors from California and from other places that they're not even here, and they're going to be renting them to students. So um, I think that's it's pushing up housing prices, which is pushing up rental prices, which is, you know, it, it's this terrible vicious circle that we're in now with these rising prices. And a lot of it is being driven, I think, by these outside investors coming in and scooping up single family homes, turning them into multi-family dwellings or just putting a lot of students in them. It's um, a national trend. A national trend. And it's something that is here now. And I just thought that it's something we might try to, I don't know if we're the right place to think about it, but it certainly is going to play into all of this. It's certainly making for a very unequal uh, 
it, it's, it's exacerbating inequities, let's put it that way. The CRC discussions on the driving the rental registration bylaw changes, a lot of it has to do with the sort of the problem properties where the inspectors have been called out frequently. Um, and I believe they're proposing a new category of rental, which is a student rental, which has several unrelated people in it. And there'll be, the draft has, I believe has slightly more stringent inspection standards for those places. So it doesn't quite address the problem that you described, Lori, but um, as when this rental registration was first passed 10 plus years ago, a large part of it was sort of the, the problem of noisy student rentals um, was, was enough to drive public opinion to in, encourage the town to adopt this in the very first place. Okay, great. Any other members have an update? Um, Vasu and then Stella. Yeah, so after I shared the outreach calendar with all of you last time, and we listed some of the advocacy groups, I also talked to Shalini and she sent me a list of uh, people that I can talk to. I reached out to Billy Spitzer, uh, who is the director at the Hitchcock Center. Uh, we met last earlier, this week, um, we had a really nice conversation and talked about the, the youth programs that uh, they have at the Hitchcock Center. And, um, uh, you know, we were talking about how we can influence the adults as well, because I think Hitchcock does mostly um, focus on the, the youth um, uh, schools in, around uh, the area, Amherst and, and Northampton. Um, and then my other recommendation to him was, uh, can we get all the advocacy groups together and, and have a discussion around what we need to do? It feels like everyone's doing um, things on their own. And um, so I, I was also talking to Shalini about this and, and we looked at the Amherst calendar and let me share my screen. One thing that, Stephanie, we wanted to talk to you is in the Amherst calendar here. Um, there is a there are drop downs here. That's I mean I can anybody can go in the community can, can go in and add a new event. And we were asking if it's possible to add a drop down for sustainability, with the intent being. Uh, right now I don't know what everybody's doing. All these different groups are doing, and I talked to Billy and asked him if there's you know, something that he can add all his events into this page. And, you know, me continuing to talk to the other advocacy groups, and if we can all have one location for all the events, I think it'll be helpful. But for that, we need to have a separate choice field here for sustainability. Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts. I shall need to talk to um, Paul about it. And he said, the town offers a community calendar, but not for separate interests. And so she wanted me to consult with you, and get your thoughts. Right, me or the committee? I got confused as who you were directing that to, Asu. I'm sorry. Uh, to, to you, Stephanie, but I mean, I'm open to listening to all the other ECAC members as well and see what they have to say. But it was meant for you, Stephanie. I wanted to ask you. I think I would have to talk to the communications director about how we have all of this laid out um, because we don't have it by interests. And there is, and I was going to say the page that you were on was for official town committees. So events, you know, the, the sustainability festival doesn't show up there. It shows up under events, which is a separate community calendar tab. So in a way, you know, they, they're by events, not by interests, right? That's how that whole thing is organized by when the date of an event is happening. So I could certainly talk to the communications director and see if that's a possibility, but I'm not sure how unwieldy that might get, but I can, I can ask. Any other thoughts on that? And then if not, my second comment, oh, Stella, did you have something? No, okay. it's unrelated. Okay. And then um, there's going to be a, a UMass alumni event at the Hitchcock Center um, in July. 
sorry, what was that? A UMass alumni event at the alumni. Center. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Vesu. Um, Stella? Yeah, so at the retreat, uh, I had, we had talked about maybe me taking up some of the transport stuff. Um, it got a little bit derailed by my daughter breaking her leg, but Steve sent me a really, 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 really great document of some research he had done on that, um, mostly with respect to electric car charging stations and increasing those. Um, so that's a great document with a lot of like really clear action items. Um, and then there's also, I had talked about maybe going and either sitting in or I think people had talked about presenting, but to the to, to TAC, to the Transport Advisory Committee. And um, they have a meeting tomorrow actually, which maybe I'll, I'll sit in on just to get a sense of what, what they're up to. So there's not like redundancy, but I kind of don't think there is because I don't know if anybody else has seen this, but they created a really incredible bicycle and pedestrian plan, like really incredible. It's great. It's long and wonderful. And um, I didn't read it in great detail, but I, I skimmed the whole thing. And that also just the existence of it kind of answers the question that it seems like they're really active on the bike and pedestrian piece of transport. So it probably does make more sense for us to focus if we do put some time and energy into transport on motorized vehicles with obviously the understanding that as it says in Steve's document, well, I'm not gonna quote Steve's document to paraphrase Steve's document. Uh, the goal is to not increase, increase um, you know, single occupancy or low occupancy motorized vehicles, but it probably does make, make more sense for us to focus on, on that as opposed to the bicycle and pedestrian stuff which it seems like TAC is really, really on top of. So that's my, that's my first impression, not having been to one of their meetings yet. Great. Yeah, I do think it would, um, and I think, I don't know if Stephanie already, did, she might've already done this, connected you with their chairs to, to um, so if you wanted to go and just introduce yourself and, see if they have any questions about the ECAC work and the CARP work. I mean, I, you know, I think that would be great. And, but I also agree that it makes sense to sort of stay, stay in communication, but also transportation's a huge beast and there's lots to do. So there's no need for us to focus on the same things. Right, and I think, I think Steve's thought that it, it does definitely fit in as kind of a sub piece of some of, some of the, the rental and um, with respect to electric car supports um fits into some of the rental bylaw work yeah definitely okay great um i just have one update as well um anyway um so i just saw actually on the in the news today that um minlo m-e-n-l-o park california has um made done a partnership with block power to electrify 10,000 homes and buildings by 2030 um for those we've talked about this in this in this group but block power is the group that presented that's working with Ithaca and there is that presentation that Andra's group helped organize with them a few months ago um and it has been finalized, I mean, I'm just reading like a Yahoo News article, but um, it was a, a partnership that was approved through a passage of a resolution of the city council. Um, so it just made me think like, given our focus on housing efficiency and rental housing and, you know, whether or not we should really be as a committee, just focusing full, kind of full throttle on, on this this area of work and seeing what would have to happen to do something like this at Amherst, like even just mapping out like what would be this the steps 
Um, so I'd be willing to think on that um, and maybe come back to this group next time with some ideas. Yeah, I'd love to work on that as well. Um, okay, so um, the great news is, is that we've had a lot of good discussion and updates. That means we are nearing the end. Of, well, we still have 45 minutes left, but um, okay. So I think next up, sorry, I lost my agenda here. Let me get it again. And, so um, and then you had education and outreach and then business. Okay. So we may have covered some of this and I know Jolene's not here, but um, is there anything to, to say on the solar planning and Amherst piece? Oh, Stephanie, you're muted. If you're Sorry, yeah. um, I was just going to say that I, I included the um, revised solar permitting pathway flowchart um, that's been dramatically altered since the last one I showed you, which really had to do with a specific project. This is a more generalized path, and I just wanted to share that with you all because I don't even think our newer members saw the old one. So I just thought I'd take a minute. It's relevant to the solar bylaw effort that's being developed. So if you just give me a minute, I'll share my screen. Yeah, great. And thank you for making this, Stephanie, because you know how much I love a flowchart. I'm glad you love a flowchart, <laughs> Laura, because this took quite some time. <laughs> so hold on one moment. Okay, are you all seeing that now? Yeah. Okay. So we just wanted to sort of give an overview. Of course, this does not cover every single scenario because each project is different. I mean, if you've had any work related to permitting, then you realize, you know, there's always issues that come up that are different from others. So it's never a one size fits all and you do the best that you can with the regulations that you've got. So um, this was specifically for addressing uh, ground mount solar. Um, but the typical pathway is when a project comes to the town, when, you know, sometimes a, a developer will just literally walk in and say, I want to do this project here in this particular location. Um, town staff will sometimes have a, like a pre-application meeting with them to sort of talk with them about what it is they're doing to get a sense of what they, what pathway they might need to follow. So it sort of starts here with kind of a general discussion. Um, sometimes other staff are brought in. So for instance, if we know there are going to be wetland issues, uh, we'll bring in the um, the wetlands administrator. If we think that there might be um, a need to impact some kind of historic structure, uh, then there might be, you know, other staff that will be brought in. So um, this is just kind of a very informal pre-application meeting that happens typically. But then that helps guide the applicant to submit a formal application that gets submitted to the, Z the ZBA, the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, and they'll do a review. And if the application has everything you know that it's that's required then they will file the application with the town clerk um, and that is where there'll be um, a legal ad submitted about the application and abutters will be notified about the application as well because then they will schedule um, a zba hearing so from there the application then goes to the planning staff and if it hasn't already been submitted to other staff um, at this point is where it will be sent to the wetlands administrator, maybe the town engineer. Um, there's typically a, a standard distribution path for various town staff um, and boards and committees that happens. But if there's like an additional one that typically isn't notified, then this is the point at which they may send it for review. Um, I'm just throwing that at this out there, you know, for no real apparent reason, but like maybe the Water Protection Supply Committee might potentially want to have a look at something. Um, they don't usually, but you know, depending on the issue, they might. So, um, you know, the questions that we basically ask are first, you know, if there are wetlands on site, then it's going to follow this pathway for Conservation Commission review. So they're going to meet with the wetlands administrator. The application is going to get submitted under the, you know, the wetlands bylaw. 
um, and regulations, then there'll be a public hearing process. Um, if there are endangered species, then they will have to submit an application to the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program if it meets certain thresholds under the Mass Environmental Policy Act, um, then those will also have to get submitted for review. And these two agencies will submit their findings directly to the Conservation Commission. So when the Conservation Commission is having their hearing process, hearing on a, on a specific application, if these two other agencies have been notified and had information submitted, the Commission will obtain that information before they make their decision. So then they'll make um, a determination uh, that maybe more information is needed um, or that it's sufficient enough and the project can go ahead without any further review, or they may decide um, that they need the full notice of intent and then they'll eventually issue an order of conditions. Um, that decision by the Conservation Commission will then sort of come down further down in this process where it will go directly to the planning board and the ZBA for their um, consideration as part of their decision. Um, the other questions, you know, that will be considered, you know, is whether um, any town land uh, or anything downtown, you know, if it's a town sponsored project, if there's going to be signage, then it's going to maybe go to the design review board, they're going to submit their information to the planning board. Um, if it requires building removal or structure impact, and it's a historic building, they're going to have to have review by the historic commission. Um, if the project has any kind of um, impact to stone walls or public shade trees, then the application is going to have to go to the public shade tree committee and the planning board. And all of these are going to these agencies and review is all going to filter to the planning board. So the ZBA process happens, but it also simultaneously, there'll also be um, a planning board review. And all of this information is basically going to get funneled to the ZBA. And then finally, the decision is ultimately issued by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that's, um, again, this is a very generalized permitting pathway, but just to show that, you know, any one project can have multiple pathways of review for one project. So, um, you know, just to be aware of what is involved when um, an application is submitted and how many different bodies and staff will review a project, and also that there are opportunities in this process for public comment and review. So for instance, the, the Conservation Commission has a public hearing process. The ZBA and the planning boards both have public hearing processes. Um, the Historic Commission will have their public meetings and you know, make comment during their, um, during their meeting as well. So there are various um, steps along the way for people to, to weigh in on projects. But of course, the, the um, feedback or the, the concerns that the public may have need to be addressed to these specific relevant bodies that should be relevant to the, what the committee or board is focusing on. So for instance, you wouldn't come and talk about a historic structure to the CONCOM that you may care very passionately about it, but that's not the place you would bring that information to. So um, so anyway, this is just to say that it's a very, very involved um, process. And when you ask me sometimes about like linear decision-making and why I sometimes say, I wish I could say it's this, but it's not always, um, you know, this is a perfect example because a project may not necessarily follow this particular path. Some might, but some might not. Others may not, you know, may not have some of these issues. So it may be a shorter pathway. So again, it, dep it depends on the project. Um, but I hope this is somewhat helpful to at least identify the various boards and committees that may be involved in decision making for a potential solar, large scale ground mount solar project. Does anybody have any questions about this? Stephanie, just a comment, I guess. Um, I mean, this is a good process, but also very bureaucratic, right? No surprises. But I, I'm just wondering how long would it take from start to finish, depending on the path it takes. I know it can change, but 
uh, worst case scenario goes through all these review boards, how long does it take from start to finish to get a decision made? It completely depends on the project because, you know, it depends on the complexity of the project or the size of the project. Um, I can tell you with, I'll just use the solar landfill only because that's one that I was directly involved in and I know that one. Um, it took longer because we were on a landfill and because we were also having a conservation restriction um, put on the south landfill as part of the development on the north, north landfill. So that, that project took, you know, I'd say the whole permitting took about a year or so. Um, it can take, again, it can take less, it can take more. There are other projects that are, you know, almost the same size, but they were on private land and they went much faster because they didn't necessarily have the same issues or they didn't have wetlands. You know, again, it, it depends on the conditions that you're dealing with. So I would say it could take anywhere from maybe best case scenario, and this is, you know, four to six months to a year, sometimes even more. Yeah, that's definitely a long time, but thank you. Yep. Laura? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. This is super helpful. Um, so I guess just what's coming to my mind is like, is there a place in this process by which the climate benefit and the benefit to meeting our goals is somewhere calculated or required to be calculated or, um, you know, I don't know, just that's something that's coming to my mind. The other thing that's coming to my mind, and I know that we are just an advisory committee and not a regulatory committee, but it just strikes me as, as, as there's no, pl there's no place in this process for ECAC and maybe there shouldn't be, but like, I still feel like all of these committees that are making decisions, all these regulatory committees that are making decisions about these types of pro projects should have the full information of the impact this is gonna have on the climate goals. And maybe that is a role that ECAC could or should play. And then maybe just wondering where that could fit in. So the development, to your answer, the development of the solar bylaw would become part of this process, right? That's gonna be part of the ZBA's response. So those things should get built into the solar bylaw in terms of, you know, your to your, what you've been saying all along is that somehow the climate goals should somehow built, be built in. So that's a point at which you would probably instill them. It doesn't really, I mean, when I think about, you know, like the historic commission or the public shade tree committee, I mean, they, they would certainly consider trees, but again, um, this is all regulatory. So I would say your opportunity for regulatory input would come with the solar bylaw. So we could put into the solar bylaw something about that. Well, potentially, potentially. 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 Okay. Yes. I mean, that's Great. what you may all want to bring and advocate for when that's being developed. That's a great, great point. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I see Steve and then Stella. Or yeah, that, Don as well. Sorry, I don't know if Don or Stella was first, but. That's a great point, Laura. And I was thinking along the same things. We, ECAC, may want to suggest to the Solar Bylaw Committee that ECAC does some kind of a cost benefit analysis that includes climate. We'll have to think about what that could be and we'd have to only, we could propose it to that group for their consideration and then advocate for it. Um, but there is that opportunity to, in the new bylaw. Um, mostly I wanted to comment on having been part of the process for the two fields at Hampshire College several years ago. This is a great overview of the permitting pathway through the town of Amherst and the regulatory departments of, of Massachusetts. There are two other equally complex, if not more complex things that solar developers have to go through. And one is connecting with the Massachusetts Solar 
um, smart solar program, which is typically done at the same time as this. And then the third one is, is applications through the utility, Eversource in our case for an interconnection agreement. And that one in particular is, if, if you were to try to make a chart of it, it would be a tangled mess of spaghetti. Um, those typically take years for the, particularly the utility to evaluate the impact on the grid, what kind of upgrades might be needed on the power lines in the neighborhood. And so the developers are faced with this sort of three different reviews of different aspects, but they are interconnected. And so sometimes the utility might say, no, you can't make it that big, or it has to be different. And that might impact how the permitting is in front of the conservation commission or conservation commission might make a change. And that requires a change over on the utility application. Um, and then the, the Massachusetts program, the SREC program, or sorry, it's now the smart solar program, has a whole series of criteria whether or not a project can receive the incentives, the smart solar incentives, which are crucial to pretty much every project that's gonna to connect to the grid. And they have a whole set of criteria as to whether projects are allowed for those incentives. And that, might, that includes a review on whether there's endangered species wildlife habitat on the parcel, not necessarily on where the solar array would be built, but on the parcel, as well as other factors, whether it's a brownfield, whether it's a forest, whether it's developed land, all of those things can influence the incentives and hence the sort of economic viability of these things. So it's no wonder that solar projects can take three to five years for development before they actually are powered onto the grid. And many projects, sort of fail to develop just because of the time it takes. They might be potentially great projects, but the investors don't want their money tied up for three to five years in a, in a, um, in a process. So this is what those other two, besides the permitting um, flow chart, make it really, really difficult for developing solar in Massachusetts. And Massachusetts is one of the better states in the country for it. So it's a tough, it's a tough thing to do. I'm done. <laughs>
town council, right? So sure. they're they're the ones who weigh in on developing the bylaws and all that in the first place. Stephanie, that Don't, raises what? a question in my mind. Then can town council overrule a ZBA decision? No. <laughs> Thanks, Don. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. They are a regulatory board and they have legal authority to, you know, we, you know, these are all, these are all legal processes. We have legal requirements of when meetings have to be held, when we have decisions need to be made. They, and we typically report to the state um, immediately, you know, when we make decisions. So no. They can make, you know, they can sort of generate the laws and the, you know, the bylaws in the community, um, but they don't have the authority to overrule. Don, you had your hand up. Oh, yeah. Um, having gone through a number of permitting processes, not necessarily for solar, but I, I do want to comment, Stephanie, this is an excellent flow chart. <laughs> and I think for all of us to understand, and I think you were saying this in so many words, this whole, this is why the zoning bylaw is so important. This is because all the ZBA does is apply the zoning bylaw to the facts of a particular application. So any of the considerations you were talking about are that we might think should be important factors um, to be in the bylaw for the, the zoning board to look at um, is, is where we can have the input because all the zoning board is gonna do is apply the zoning bylaw to the particular application. Um, and it either, and, and that gets very complex too. I mean, some things depending upon what the zoning bylaw says. Some things can be built as a matter of right. Um, some things in some zoned areas, they require special permits. Um, those are very different processes. Um, you know, the zoning bylaw is gonna have use limitations in what can be built in a particular zone. And it's also gonna have dimensional requirements as to you know, the setback requirements and height requirements and all sorts of other requirements. But both the CONCOM, and I think, Stephanie, you know this, because, I mean, you're, you're just applying the Wetlands Protection Act and Amherst's Wetlands Bylaw. And the zoning board or the planning board, depending upon, in our case, the zoning board, is simply applying the facts of a particular proposal to the to the existing bylaw and 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 whether it meets the requirements of the existing bylaw so our, our real input is going to be in this bylaw yeah i guess that was the point i was trying to make in doing all of this was that's your that's your opportunity So are you going to stop okay. sharing? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and thank you again for pulling, putting that together and going through it for us. Um, any other questions for Stephanie or any other? Um, so we know when the next meeting is. Unfortunately, it's not at a time I can join, but hopefully those who can will be able to. Um, and maybe at our next meeting, Laura, there were two more things on the agenda. One of them I had prepared to speak. Yeah, sorry, I'm just finishing up this piece uh -huh. on solar. Was that not clear? No, okay, sorry. Clear. sorry. Uh, um, so we might want to um, talk a bit at our next, at our meeting in, in, on the 13th about how we, the best way Dwayne wants us to interact with him through the committee and, um, so maybe we'll put that on the agenda. That was that was it for that. Um, so yeah, let's go to the next agenda item: uh, outreach and communication.
don't remember what was uh, what we had to talk about. <laughs> um, did it say in the minutes, uh, Stella? Oh, sorry, Vasu. You, it's it's six o'clock, so you're having your robot voice again, um, and <laughs> you may have already given an up in an update. Well, maybe let's maybe if you want to look at the the minutes and see if there's anything specific. Unless Stephanie, you know, um, all it said was next steps for planning, education, and outreach. How and who was what was identified in the minutes for this discussion. Okay, I, I mean, the only thing that I can say I mentioned earlier is I'm connecting with different groups and I know Steve, you express interest as well in being part of this. So I'll, I'll hopefully get together with a bunch of different advocacy groups and pitch off center and the library as well and see if we can plan something. Yeah, that sounds great, Vesu. And we can also invite groups to come to our meetings too, if like there's a group out there that's doing stuff that you know we want to bring in and have tell like you know that may you know have them tell us what their plans are in terms of communication and outreach around climate action and then we can coordinate that way too so got it yep thanks Laura. um okay so then business community outreach Okay, so I had um, I have mostly questions. I, what I want to do is share a single slide that has a lot of questions on it. Um, and I was hoping to use this part of the meeting to brainstorm a little bit about what needs to be done and how to do it, because I feel like I'm just getting my head around all the different things the committee has done. And I've sort of tried to enumerate some of them and how outreach, I, I wasn't thinking so much business as I was landowners, as I was uh, landlords, right? Um, but businesses sort of fits in there too. Um, so if I can, I'd like to share a screen, screen two with my questions. <laughs> so let me just put you all back now so I can see you. Um, okay, and you should be able to see, huh, what's that? That's not right. Can you see my, oh yeah. Can you see the uh, push for new rental registration bylaw thing at the top? Okay, good. Yeah. So these are the sorts of things that I know we've been doing and I'm learning a little bit about, a little more about every week. Um, you know, I'm slowly making my way through all these different reports and things that have been sent my way. Um, but what I wondered about this new rental registration bylaw, for example, is, is there a need for outreach around that? And if so, how do we do that? And who do we reach out to? And along with that, um, there was sort of this number three. I'm going to skip to that because there was a mention at in April, April I think, about a pilot project to do a deep energy retrofit on a multifamily dwelling. And I was wondering if you know anything has been done on that. And if not, how do we do that? And can we reach out to somebody even before we have the input from the registration by law about where the low hanging fruit are, you know, where the most buildings most in need of something? Can we get a pilot program going at the same time? Um, I'm just gonna throw some of these out there so that all of them are in the air. And then if we have time, we'll go through them, I hope. Um, there was this Empower grant that finally was finalized. I saw the announcement of it this week online. That was very nice. Um, I wondered if landowners, if the landlords are involved at any level at all in that, and if so, how do we bring them into the discussion or how do we reach out to them with the results of whatever discussion comes out of that? Um, the CPACE program, um, has anyone in Amherst actually made use of it yet? We've talked about it, but I don't, I don't know if anyone's actually used it yet. And um, if so, what's the best way to, in, reach out to landlords again and enlighten them about it and get them involved in using it. Um, from the, then there's a couple of uh, items from the CARP that I glommed onto. One of them is, well, one of them was developing the deep energy retrofit um, and the outreach. And so it's, it's basically that same thing again, but in partnership with Mass Save and Community Choice Aggregation, which I don't quite know how, what that means or how to go about doing it. What does it mean to uh, have an outreach and engagement campaign in partnership with, is there some, I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, there's also the engaging conversation with residents, businesses, community organizations, Eversource, et cetera, for smart meters. Smart meters are mentioned in the, in the CARP. And I'm wondering, is anybody, has that even happened? The smart meters exist in Amherst? If they do, I don't even know about them. 
um, who's doing it, how do we get landowners to step up? And then, you know, just in case in this discussion, we don't cover this, who are the main, do we have a list of the landowners? Do we have a way to contact them? Do we have an organization they all show up at every other Thursday? You know, is there, is there some place that we can go to, um, to speak to them directly? So these are all the things that are going through my mind when we talk about outreach to landowners. And I was hoping to get input on any or all of these from you guys. Um, we've been at this a little bit longer. Do we have time to do a little brainstorming around this or is there a particular person I should reach out to, to get, you know, I, I can do this one at a time and talk to Steve and talk to, you know, or we can maybe spend a little time brainstorming around this. <laughs> How to proceed. Yeah, so one, um, just throw out a thought here. One thing that came up, Stephanie, I'm thinking about our conversation you, me, and Andra had with Paul. I think you raised a really interesting idea of, you know, could we bring together even just the forward, sort of the developers in town that have been forward leaning in terms of developing low, energy use properties and maybe have an initial discussion with with them about you know what's their motivation would they want to pilot on something would um would they be willing to speak to other I think your idea was maybe getting a couple of the forward forward leaning developers to if we if we got a meeting where we brought a lot of land owners slash um multifamily unit owners together, could we um, have these forward leaning developers speak to their sort of the business case that they've found in terms of leaning forward and doing more than what's required. Um, so that's one idea that I think would potentially turn into, could turn into a pilot project and or be a way that we also let people know about CPACE. Is there somebody in particular that I should be? Is this a conversation? Should, should you and I talk more about that, Laura? Is there someone in particular that I should approach about how do we? Who? Who? Do, I don't know who these people are. For example, I I have not a single name, right? So. Yeah, Don. I see your hand is up. Yeah, um, Laurie, I can introduce you to some of them. Um, you know, Dave Williams and 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 Kyle. Uh, who are Archipelago. I know both of them. Barry Roberts is obviously a big landowner here. Uh, Kurt Shumway, I know him. He owns a lot of rental properties. So, you know, I could facilitate you touching base with them, particularly um, with, uh, with Dave and Kyle. Um, I know them quite well. Um, and I'm willing to help. If, if, if that's the direction you want to go, that's for sure. So, Stephanie and then Steve. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, and the idea was to specifically reach out to landowners who actually have embraced and are moving in the direction that this committee is advocating for. So installing EV charging, installing solar on their buildings. And Ron Lavertier is a developer who I know who has done that um, quite that? a bit. So, um, and I could connect you with Ron. Um, and that was, Ron was actually the person I had in mind when I was thinking about someone who might be maybe willing to, you know, sort of be part of a discussion. And in my mind, it was something that would be, you know, people within their, you know, people, developers talking to developers, basically. So not a whole lot of heavy influence of us, other right. than helping to make it happen, but them talking to each other. Um, and Ron being able to sort of say, this is what I've done. These are the programs I've used to help me do it. I know that Ron has used the um, Eversource uh, 
EV ready program. Ron installed some EV charging through that program. Um, pretty sure, you know, he's taken advantage of other opportunities as well. So for solar, um, I think he, he, when we did Solarize, Ron was uh, participated in that effort as well. So those are the types of things I was thinking about. What was his last name? Ron Lavertier. I can, I can send it to you um, and make a connection if you'd like at a point when you're ready to sort of have a, a bigger discussion. Yes, Steve. This this is great, Lori, and I think sort of been I've, I've been hoping for quite a while that an initiative to connect with the landowners and the building, the property owners, to get them talking and sharing notes, and to introduce them to the incentive program and to show them some positive examples of how it has worked. Um, I think that'd be great because that. You know, as I think about the rental efficiency, the rental unit efficiency things, you know, we're not going to get very far if the property owners are unwilling to do uh, retrofit or if they, like some of us have discovered that there are no contractors or it's two years out before you can get a contractor. Um, so this is great. I think the um, specific thoughts, there's the Northeast um, Energy Association up in Greenfield, and they, did I get that name right? Um, Nessie. Nessie, yes. They do a lot with this sort of thing. They, they sponsor tours of retrofitted buildings. Um, they work with a lot of contractors. So they may have a source for finding uh, examples of deep energy retrofits in multifamily. If, if not in Amherst, certainly locally. I know there's some in Northampton them have been part of their sort of national tour where they open up some of these buildings and show other building owners how they were done. Nice. Um, so Nessie could be a really great source as well. N-E-S-S-E? N-E-S-E-A. N-E-S-E-A. And so that, that's, that's great. I, I, you and Don, I think would be perfect for um, bringing these folks together and helping to explore how to go forward. As for number one, I'll let you know if there's any need for public outreach around the red, rental registration bylaw, I'll let you all know um, when that time comes. Thanks. As for number two, family outreach is working on that. Um, we'll have to sort of look at the strategy for that. Um, I think, you know, again, that we want that driven by the renters. So there may not be as much of a role for ECAC in that, but doesn't mean we can't support them. So I think it just more to come on that. And Lori, I just, I'm sorry, while I'm talking and I just had an opportunity, you had asked about this community choice aggregation and mass save and what that even meant. Um, so Working, what does working with them even mean? I know what the CCA, I know what the community source aggregation, is, community choice aggregation is, but I don't know how we would work with them to reach out. And I think, so there is a joint powers entity that's gonna be developed. And I think it's gonna be less, ECAC might be approached to support the work of that entity, which is the three communities that are involved that will be involved in the CCA. So the Joint Powers Entity is sort of like an, an umbrella organization and the CCA will be part of that organization. That will just be like one project that that entity is doing. And I think the idea was to create some kind of a more, um, you know, programming and energy efficiency opportunities uh, through the JPE, but the CCA would, you know, the, con the consultant that we work with for the CCA could help basically with promoting the Mass Safe program, if that makes sense. So that's how I think that's where they were seeing that partnership. And then if the J joint powers entity exists, which it will have to in order to have the CCA, um, all of this could live as programming as part of that entity that you all could be asked to assist with, basically getting the word out. Okay. Cool. This is great. <laughs> and Lori, I'm sorry, one last thing. Can you get this slide to me, please, so I can include yeah. it in the packet? Yeah, yeah, I will do that. I was also just going to put the seven questions in the uh, in the um, minutes, but I'll send you the slide. That'd be great. Thanks. 
I just threw it together a half hour before the meeting, so I apologize for not okay. thoughts that have been. I've been putting it together for for a few days, but uh, didn't congeal into a set of questions until t minus twenty minutes. No worries. Thanks, um, Stephanie. Can I ask a question about process? So, um, you know, something that we do at series that's effective occasionally is, you know, bring companies together with, you know, companies that are lagging a little bit with a couple companies that are leading and have the leading companies talk to the lagging companies, right? Um, it sounds like this is a similar kind of idea, not that anybody's leading or lagging, but that we're sort of bringing these developers together or landowners together to like have a frank conversation with each other. And we found that it's really hard to do that in a public way. Um, so, but we're a public committee. And so, so is there like, how would we, is our role just sort of trying to make this happen and then not being involved in it actually happening because we need it, we want it to be able, I think we want them to be able to speak to each other without having it need to be a public meeting with public comment and, and things of that nature, right? Sure. I mean, one of, one of you, if one of you were like maybe a, a facilitator, right. Mm -hmm. You could you could set it up so that one of you is a facilitator for that meeting and it's not it wouldn't be a public meeting as long as you don't have a quorum of members show up. Um, but I would even advise you, you know, just to sort of basically entrust an individual to take that on and facilitate. And then, of course, I'd always be part, you know, I'd always be available um, to support and be part of whatever. OK, great. And yeah, we could do like Chatham House rules or something where we take notes, but we don't attribute them to anyone in particular so that we, as a committee, if we wanna see what was spoken about, we can potentially do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, well, but, if it's a meeting of other people with just one of us in attendance, we can just take notes. So, no, I mean, what's wrong? That should be okay. Yeah, but if you're, I think Laura's point is if you're sharing them with the group, you don't wanna to attribute to them to a person because everything, anything that you share as a committee is going to be publicly oh, oh, oh. accessible. So it's just so people will talk more frankly and openly. Duh. Okay. I'm new at this. <laughs> it's not, that's not, it's not always obvious. So yeah, Chatham House Rules is also not a like normal term that normal people talk about. <laughs> yeah, wait, what, what was it? Chatham House? Chatham House. Yeah. I don't even know what it comes from. Does anybody know the history of Chatham House Rules? Isn't Chatham House like someplace in Britain? Yeah, I think oh, so. It's a world policy think tank? It, it may go way back to Quaker traditions. No, it's a it's a it's a policy think tank in London. Oh. <laughs> All I know is that Chatham House rules means that you take notes but you attribute. don't attribute them to individual people. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, great. So, in um, so Lori, do we have a clear, do you feel like you have a clear next step or should we talk quickly about that before we move on? I think I need to think about it. I've got a lot of information now that I didn't have before. And I think I'll probably be contacting Don for more input and, uh, we'll probably come to the next meeting with some sort of a proposal to do something, I hope. Okay. By the way, okay. I, looked up, I looked up Chatham House rules in my phone. It was developed by the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which was an independent organization. It is otherwise known as the Chatham House. <laughs> which refers to the 18th century premises in the heart of London. There you go, Stella, you were right. It had something to do with England. Um, okay, so I think what I've heard through this conversation is that for our meeting on the 13th, which will be our next meeting, we're gonna start with a vote of the chair and vice chair. Um, the other two items I think we've highlighted are, you know, revisiting this this discussion, Lori. So engagement with landowner, landowners slash developers, 
an update on there. And then I think we should put on the agenda an update from Dwayne on the first meeting of the solar bylaw group and a discussion on the best way for how he would like ECAC to support him or what, you know, sort of how we, how we do that. Um, anything else missing? And then I don't know if that's too, if you could just give updates during ECAC member updates, but if you have a specific item you want to bring in terms of educational outreach, you can always just email Stephanie or I before the meeting and we'll put it on the agenda. Just get it to me well in advance of the meeting because I have to post legally 48 hours ahead and also I need to get the packet out to the committee. Great. Um, any other agenda items off the top of folks' head? Otherwise, like Stephanie said, just send them over. Just another thank you to Laura for sharing. Oh, yeah, no worries. This will be my last one. <laughs> um, well, I trust you all to pick an amazing chair. And again, happy to talk to folks about, about it and excited to have some new blood and energy in this role because um, I think that's always good to do. I just realized um, nobody nominated Laura for another <laughs> term. <laughs> could revisit that at the beginning of next meeting. If I come back and you voted me back in, I'll, I'll be <laughs> a little bit disappointed. <laughs> it has been very fun and I've learned so much and I've definitely, the skills I've learned in doing this work have definitely benefited me in my other roles and responsibilities. So um, I appreciate give, be give, being given the opportunity in the first place. Um, Okay, just, I guess, real quick, do we have any um, attendees? No, it looks like we don't. No, we don't. Great, so no no public comment. Um, I think we can wrap unless anybody has one last thing. No, okay. Thank you all. Bye, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.